All right, welcome again to General Assembly. Um, it's great to have you all here. My name's Anand Chopra McGowan. I'm with the Enterprise team here at GA. It's, um, it's fantastic to see so many um, friends, clients, um, uh, members of the GA community. Uh, I'd like to introduce um, our CEO and founder, uh, Jake Schwartz. Um, we'll be taking questions afterward, uh, after Peter speaks. Thank you, Peter, for joining. Uh, and uh, I'll pass it over to Jake now. Thank you. Thank you, Anand. Uh, and thank you all for being here. Um, it's super exciting uh, to have Peter here, um, who's someone who I've admired very much as both an entrepreneur and as an investor um, and as a provocative contrarian. Um, it's a, a real pleasure to have him here at General Assembly, um, especially because in a lot of ways, and we talk about this internally, uh, General Assembly's vision to build this global community of individuals empowered to pursue work they love um, primarily through skill-based education, we feel like is um, in a lot of ways informed by some of the stuff um, that Peter has done around ed education and, and discussed around uh, liberal arts and, and what it is in today's world. Um, but there's a lot more to talk about, and I'm sure you'll get into all of that. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you all for being here. Welcome uh, members of, of our enterprise team and, the, and their clients. Welcome students, welcome alumni. And I see some uh, great members of the New York City tech community here as well. And I also want to give a big shout out to everyone who's watching this via live stream right now. Uh, welcome from everywhere around the world. Um, I will keep it brief, so that is it. Thank you for coming to GA. Um, and thank you so much for being here, Peter. Welcome. We're just so honored to have you here. We're really excited to hear what you have to say. Thanks a lot. Um, well, there's sort of many different, uh, many different directions one can go in. I, I thought I'd maybe keep my comments relatively brief tonight, and then we'd just make it as interactive as, 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 we, possibly, as we possibly can. Um, one, one, of the, um, you know, one of the challenges in teaching entrepreneurship and writing about entrepreneurship is that there's, there's a sense in which the critical thing in every business that really makes it succeed is always unique. And there, there are certain things where there are processes you can learn, where the things you can study and they can be repeated. But the, uh, the, the truly um, uh, differentiating critical thing is always a, uh, a unique thing. And, uh, you know, and so there's sort of, there is no strict science of entrepreneurship. You know, every moment in the history of technology and the history of business only happens once. The next Mark Zuckerberg will not be starting a social networking site the next Larry Page will not be starting a search engine. The next Bill Gates won't start an operating system. And if you're copying these people, you're in some sense not learning from them. And so, uh, and so one of the challenges then becomes, you know, what can you actually say at all if the critical thing is always this innovative, different, uh, new, uh, new element? Um, I try to get at it through sort of a series of indirect uh, questions to try to sort of get people thinking. The, you know, the, uh, the business question is what great companies no one's starting. The intellectual question is, tell me something that's true that very few people agree with you on, which is always a fantastic interview question. It's a really hard one for people to answer uh, because um, it's always, I think the good answers, it's not that we don't have answers to these questions, but they're, they're hard to articulate because the truly good answers are ones you don't want to actually tell the person asking the question. You know, if you, uh, it's like answers like the education system doesn't work or the political system screwed up. These are bad answers because everyone already knows them to be true. Good answers are ones the interviewer will uh, not want to hear, that people will not want to hear. We live in a world in which uh, courage is in much shorter supply than genius. Now, in my book, Zero to One, I give a whole series of um, answers to this question, things I believe to be true that, that most people do not agree with me on. But I'm going to maybe just focus on, um, on one of those answers, uh, which, which is, that, um, is that I think this is the critical thing in, um, in, in, in business, sort of the business strategy part, is that uh, most people believe that capitalism and competition are synonyms. I believe they are antonyms. A capitalist is someone who's in the business of accumulating capital. A world of perfect competition is a world where all the profits are competed away. Um, if you want to compete like crazy, you should, just, you should just start a restaurant. You're never going to make any money. It's not going to work. Chances are it will go out of business, but you will get the most ferocious competition you can possibly imagine. 
And, um, and then I think the, uh, the kind of business you want to build is a monopoly. And this is, if you're an entrepreneur, an investor, uh, an early employee, you always want to be in a monopoly. And we can, we can have a debate about the public policy, when are these things good or bad from the point of view of uh, society. But from the inside, that's what you always want to aim for. And I, I've, I've come to believe over time that to a first approximation, there really are only two kinds of uh, businesses in this world. There are businesses that are monopolies that make money, and there, there are businesses that compete like crazy that generally do not make money. And uh, this very fundamental uh, distinction is, uh, is obscured and uh, is, 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 is actually uh, rather poorly understood uh, by people in all sorts of contexts. Um, it's poorly understood for a variety of reasons. Um, there's an intellectual uh, failure mode, which is uh, that the people um, who, um, who, have, who are in crazy competition always understate the competition. The people of monopolies never talk about the monopolies. And so the apparent difference is always much smaller than the real difference. So if you are, um, you know, if you're a company like uh, Google, which I use as the paradigm example of a successful monopoly, where you've had no competition in the search market in 13 years, uh, and you have made runaway uh, profits, uh, you're not competing with anybody in the world, um, you will never talk about the search engine. You instead uh, will say that you're in this very uh, big, amorphous space called technology, and you are competing with all sorts of people. You're competing with Apple, with Android, and Facebook, and Amazon. You're competing with the car companies, with the self-driving car, and there's competition everywhere, and no, this is not the monopoly the government is looking for. <laughs> and, then, um, and then on the other side, if you were to leave tonight's presentation and conclude that you wanted to really, uh, you were really determined now to start your restaurant, um, and uh, as you'd very quickly encounter a series of problems, people wouldn't want to give you money, it's a terrible idea, it's money losing, and you would then come up with a fictional narrative where you sort of make it, make, make the market sound much narrower than it is. And you would say, okay, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be the only uh, British Nepalese fusion cuisine um, in, you know, in, in this part of Manhattan. And, um, and so you come up with a fictionally narrow a narrative or a fictionally broad one. And as a result, this question always gets obscured. And uh, I think it's, it doesn't get focused on enough. But I also think there's a part of it where uh, we, we end up getting psychologically addicted to competition. It's extremely validating. We think of uh, we, our identity gets wrapped up in winning certain competitive uh, uh, games. Um, and you know, we, uh, I, there's sort of the opening line of uh, Anna Karenina is that all happy families are alike, all unhappy families are unhappy in their own special way. And I always think the opposite is true of business. All happy companies are different because they found something unique all unhappy companies are alike because they fail to escape the essential sameness that is competition. And um, when the Wall Street Journal excerpted that chapter from my book entitled All Happy Companies Are Different, they retitled it as Competition is for Losers, which is you know, a little bit punchier. And it, um, and it goes directly to our, int you know, our intuition is always, well, the losers are the people who don't compete effectively enough. The losers are the people who are not so good on the high school sports team or who are um, you know, who are not getting grades quite good enough to get into the right school or the right graduate school. We don't think of the losers as the people who are somehow unhealthily addicted to competing in a whole variety of conventional ways. And, um, and so the, the, you know, the autobiographical part of this is I feel, you know, I was incredibly uh, tracked um, in all these sort of super competitive ways when I was growing up in, you know, high school and, um, and college in, uh, in Northern California. I was a uh, my eighth grade junior high school yearbook, you know, one of my friends wrote in, you know, I know you're going to get into Stanford in four years. Four years later, I got into Stanford. I went to Stanford. Then I got, went to Stanford Law School. Ended up in, um, in one of these uh, top law firms here in New York. You know, from the outside, it was a place everybody wanted to get in. From the inside, it was a place where everybody wanted to get out. When I left after seven months and three days, um, <laughs> one, one, of the, one of the people down the hall from me, uh, uh, said it was really reassuring to see me leave. He had no idea it was possible to escape from Alcatraz. And, um, and I sort of, I tried to, uh, and of course, of course, all he had to do was go out the front door and not come back. But psychologically, this was not what people could do because their whole sense of identity was wrapped up in all these competitions they had, they had won over time. And, uh, and so we, so even though, you know, we always should be going through the secret gate that no one has found, 
we, are, we instead always want to go through the, uh, the, the, the very narrow door that tons and tons of people are trying to rush through at the same time. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, and so this sort of imitative competition is this you know, super powerful dynamic. Uh, it's, uh, you know, already in the time of Shakespeare, the word ape meant both primate and to imitate. So there's something very deep in human nature where we learn language by imitating our parents. It's how culture gets transmitted. Uh, but then there are a lot of cases where imitation goes, goes badly wrong, where it, it leads to, you know, all sorts of p crazy peer dynamics. It leads to financial bubbles. It leads to sort of the madness of crowds. And, um, and I think it's something we always, um, we should never underestimate how much we get uh, pulled into this in, in, in one way or another. Um, the, uh, you know, there's, there's always a strange phenomenon in Silicon Valley where so many of the successful entrepreneurs seem to be suffering from a mild form of Asperger's. And I think, I think we always need to flip this around as an indictment of our society. And we need to ask, what is it about our society where anyone who does not have Asperger's is, um, is sort of talked out of all of their original creative ideas before they're even fully formed. You sort of pick up all these subtle social cues from people and sense, oh, that's too weird, that's too different, that doesn't make sense, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, maybe I'll just go open that restaurant. So, um, so when, um, you know, when, when I try to then apply this sort of monopoly idea, there sort of are in many different applications. Let me give maybe three, and then we'll, we'll, we'll uh, uh, open it to more of a Q&A. Um, one, um, one application, and this is sort of a question I often get asked, or what are some trends I see in technology? What are trends? What are things that are happening? Um, I always don't like the question because, you know, I, I feel um, you're sort of tempted to just give really banal answers, and, you know, there'll be more cell phones in five years or something. But, um, but I, think, um, I think to a first approximation, I would say all trends are overrated. And so education software, healthcare IT software, overrated. SaaS enterprise software, very overrated. <laughs> if you hear the words big data or cloud computing, you need to think fraud. You should run away as fast as you possibly can. <laughs> and um, and the, reason, um, the reason these buzzwords um, are always problematic is they're like a tell, like in poker. It's a tell that you're bluffing, that, that, that there's nothing unique or differentiating about your company, um, and that is just one of many of a kind. And so if it's, you know, and you don't want to be, um, and, it's, and so the buzzwords make it easy to describe what you're doing, but, but they come at the price of uh, making your company undifferentiated and completely conventional. And sort of when you hear a proliferation of buzzwords, that's always a big warning sign. So it's like, we're, you know, we're building a, a SaaS platform for educational software in the cloud using mobile devices. Um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you don't, because, and this is because you don't want to be, you don't want to be the fourth online pet food store or the, you know, 10th thin film solar panel company or anything like that. And I think a lot of the really great companies are ones that, uh, that are actually really differentiated uh, where there's no straightforward narrative there aren't, we, because we don't actually have the words, we don't have the precise categories to describe the company. And that's often a good starting point. So, uh, so if it's too, um, and then, you know, and then of course it gets, you know, sort of many layers to this. One of the ways in which it gets tricky is that um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of great companies sometimes are still described conventionally, but they're really not. So, uh, you know, Google would have described itself as a search engine in the late 90s. Uh, and, it would have, and people would say, well, we don't need to invest in search since there already are lots of search engines. But the reality was it was just, um, it was actually the first machine powered search with the page rank algorithm. So it was very different from, um, from the human powered search engines that had come before. Or Facebook would have been characterized as a social network in 2004. And certainly there had already been a whole series of social networking companies. And my friend Reid Hoffman ended up starting LinkedIn years later. Started a company back in 1997 called SocialNet. They already had social networking in the name of the company. And they had all these theories. It would be, you know, you would, um, uh, you'd have these avatars in cyberspace, and some people would be cats, and other people would be dogs, and you'd basically um, ne network or interact with one another. And, uh, and that didn't quite work. And I think it's because networking or social networking is not what people are actually interested in. What matters is real identity. And Facebook is valuable because it cracked the real identity problem, and that's what it actually solved. It wasn't uh, networking in the abstract. 
Um, so anyway, so I think, I think getting the labels right, getting the categories right, is often uh, very, very important. But, uh, but if, if you have a company where it's always defined in too conventional a set of categories, uh, it's likely to be symptomatic of something that's, uh, that's, uh, that's very off. Now, the, um, the second uh, application of this monopoly idea is that, uh, is that you often have, um, that you often, uh, uh, one of the, and this is where I sort of disagree the most with, I think, sort of conventional business advice. Uh, conventional business advice is always you should go after big markets. Um, the monopoly idea is you should get to a large market share. You have a monopoly if you have a large share of a market. When you're starting a company, you're starting small, so you want to get to a large share of your market quickly. Therefore, you want to start with very small markets. You take over a small market, and then you expand over time. Uh, PayPal started with 30,000 power sellers on eBay. Um, it was sort of an idiosyncratic subset of the online payments context, but they had some very, uh, very unique problems. It was possible to come with a vastly superior solution to quickly gain mind share, gain market share, and we got to about 30, 35% market share in three months. Facebook started with 10,000 students at Harvard. It went from zero to 60% market share in 10 days. That was an auspicious start, even though it was a market that would have been so small that you could not have gotten a venture capitalist to finance it as a, as a business plan. Um, and then if you want sort of the, the opposite end of the spectrum, I would say that all the clean tech companies of the last decade, um, you know, they, they failed for many different reasons. Um, the failures typically, uh, by the way, I think failure is always very overrated because um, uh, whenever you fail, you never learn much from it because uh, you typically failed for so many different reasons. You failed for like half a dozen different independent reasons. Um, you might figure out one of them. The next time around, you'll fail for the other five. And so, um, so I always, uh, always think we should push back against the sort of idea of failure as somehow educationally uh, valuable or something. But, um, but I think that, uh, so I think the clean tech companies um, as a whole had these overdetermined failures. They failed for many different reasons. But one, one specific failure was that the markets were just too big. The, the PowerPoint slides you saw, they started with, uh, you know, uh, one of the first slides was almost always something like, you know, we're, we're in this market called energy. It's measured in hundreds of billions or trillions of dollars. And then if you have a fraction of a fraction of a pie, um, um, you know, we can have a big company, but you will have no pricing power. And so, you know, if you're, if you're one, uh, if you're a thin film solar panel company, you then have to beat the other nine thin film solar panel companies. Then you have to beat the other 90 solar panel companies. Then you have to beat the wind companies. Then you have to beat, uh, you know, um, various other things. You have to beat the frackers that came out of right field, the cheap Chinese manufacturing that came out of left field. And so when you're a minnow in a vast ocean, that's always, that's always a very, very bad place uh, to, try and, uh, to try and be. Um, I think that it's often, um, you know, I, I think there's often this sort of history of, uh, of technology piece that's, uh, that, that I like to stress, uh, would be, you know, sort of my third uh, and maybe the concluding point, which is that um, really valuable companies, um, it's always a combination of two things. Uh, they create a lot of value for the world and you capture some fraction of the value you create. So a great company will create X dollars in value and you will capture Y percent of X. And so, and the critical thing to understand is that X and Y are independent variables. X can be very big and Y can still be zero. And, um, and I think one of the, uh, and in, in this sort of area of innovation around technology, where you invent something new, um, people often make the mistake of thinking X is very large uh, and therefore the company will be valuable, but the value is only X times Y percent. Um, and I think if we had a sort of write a history of innovation of the last 200, 250 years, um, it would be actually, a re I think there's sort of a very disturbing history of innovation that could be written where basically um, you had sort of all these delusional entrepreneurs and inventors and scientists and um, they all had delusions about Y being a number other than zero. And the history of invention has been that most of the inventors have been completely screwed out of their inventions. They, they didn't capture any of the value of what they created. Um, you know, if you, look at, um, if you look at the early Industrial Revolution in Britain, late 18th, early 19th century, you had sort of these textile manufacturing processes, 
and uh, they were improving in efficiency at the rate of seven to ten percent a year, um, year after year. I mean, it was an enormous, you know, it was a huge transformation of Britain from you know 1780 to 1850. Um, but you know, you were competing with hundreds of other textile mill factory owners. Everybody was sort of co copying everybody else's processes, and so it was it was good for society. But um, but even by 1850. Um, all the profits have been competed away. Most of the wealth in Britain was still held by the landed aristocracy as late as 1850. So the entire first industrial revolution, even though it was very valuable for society, um, very little of that was captured by the people who actually invented uh, any of the, of, of the machines that, 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 that drove it. And there are sort of many variations of this. You know, the smaller example would be disk drive manufacturing in the 1980s, where you could come up with a better disk drive than anybody else. You could beat everybody in the world. Um, and then a year and a half later, someone else would come up with another, one that would be better in turn and wipe you out. And over the course of a decade, disk drives improved dramatically. But again, uh, the investors, the entrepreneurs, the founders, the early employees of these companies did not make any money because they were not able to capture any of the value. The aviation industry, 20th century, I believe the cumulative profits of the airlines are approximately zero dollars over, you know, this is an unusually bad one. They don't even get sort of the risk-free rate of return. It's zero. It's less than the risk-free rate. Um, and it's, it's again, uh, incredible innovation. Uh, it's clearly quite valuable, but, but, um, but very little of that is captured. If you look at, um, if you compare the uh, domestic U.S. airline industry with, with search, um, it's about, you know, it's something like, you know, the numbers I looked at were 2013, but something like 180 billion in revenues by the airline companies, something like 50 billion in, uh, in search revenues. And so you could say, and this sort of fits our common sense intuition that if you had to choose between getting rid of search engines and getting rid of airplanes, you'd probably get rid of search engines. Airplanes are probably somehow somewhat, somewhat more important uh, uh, kind of technology at the end of the day. But uh, Google was worth about seven times as much as all the airplane companies in the US put together. And that's because they can't make any money because it's all getting competed away again. Um, and so I do think, um, I do think this, this, has been, uh, this has been sort of a recurrent history. So you, you need to not just, you know, to have a successful business, it's not enough to be the first mover, although you have to be the first mover. Um, you also have to be the last mover. And you have to sort of, you have to maintain a sustainable advantage for quite some period of time. When I, when I started uh, PayPal, uh, early on in the PayPal history, we did sort of a discounted cash flow analysis of the business. It was in March 2001. We'd been in business for 27 months. And you have sort of a growth rate and a discount rate. Uh, the growth rate's faster than the discount rate. And so it turns out, it turned out that about 75 to 80% of the value of the PayPal business as of 2001 came from cash flows in years 2011 and beyond. And that's what the uh, math tells you for just about every tech company in 20, uh, 2015. Three quarters or more of the value is going to come from uh, profit streams in years 2025 and beyond. This is not the way we ever think about this stuff. We always think about, well, we just need to figure out what, what are we doing the next month, the next quarter. Um, but from a value of the business perspective, one of the most critical questions is not just, are you going to grow and are you going to scale? It's, will this company endure? Will it last? And, um, and will it still be dominant a decade or two decades out? Because that's where, that's where these, these vast profits are, are going to be made. Now, I think, um, I think one of the reasons um, so much around uh, Silicon Valley and the information technology revolution has this revenge of the nerds feel to it today is that uh, I, I believe software is one of the very few exceptions to this. Um, where uh, there's sort of an unusually large number of monopoly-like businesses that can be created in software. And the, um, the, the reason for this is that, uh, is that you, you typically, it's possible to have something that's dramatically better than the, the next best thing. So you can sort of, by some, on some dimension, get a big quantum improvement. So you, you always need a big quantum leap to get people's attention. So you can somehow get people's attention. Um, it's possible to get very, very fast adoption. So you can get super fast adoption, and people can never catch up with you. And then there's a lot of stickiness, and people get locked in. And so it has sort of, if you were to draw this on a chart, you say the evolution of the software industry has sort of this punctuated equilibrium feel, where you have, you know, you have a big 
jump, then you have a long equilibrium for a decade or two decades or three decades where a company can generate these monopoly profits, and then eventually it's at risk of getting disrupted in turn. Um, and that's a very different structure from the continuous innovation one that dominates uh, so, many other, so many other industries in our society and that, that's made, uh, made it so hard uh, to succeed as an, as an innovator. And there's a lot more I could say, but I think uh, we should maybe open up some questions and discussion. I'll go from there. Thank you. Awesome. All right. My mic? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, cool. So we have a bunch of questions. I want to make sure that we also get a couple questions from live stream um, as well. Where's, um, where's Isabel? Yeah, okay. Oh, there she is. Okay, cool. Um, I'll pop over there in a moment, all right? Um, Chris. Hi, Peter. Chris Freilich from First Round. Lots been said about the PayPal mafia. Anything that you would comment on from what you've learned about people and those likely to go on to do great things or the environment they come from? You know, it's, um, I, I used to sort of be a super strong believer that it was just all about the people and all about the teams. And I, I think there are still some important things one can say about that. At this point, I think it's actually much more important what the strategy is. So if you had just sort of, if you had like four really talented people and they said, you know, we're just going to lock ourselves in a room till we come up with a great idea, <coughs> um, that can sometimes work. Uh, although I don't think that's a terribly investable hypothesis, you know? And so I think the ideas are, I've sort of come to this view where I think the ideas are often more important than the, the people, or that um, there, are, there are a lot of talented people and there's more of a shortage of great ideas. Uh, but let me, um, I would say two, um, two team dynamics that I think are, that I, that, I, that I like to always focus on, I think are quite good. Um, for a very early stage company, I always like to ask the prehistory question. Um, so what were you doing before? How long have you known each other? How long have you been working together? A, uh, a good answer to the prehistory, a bad answer to the prehistory question is, we met at an entrepreneurial networking event a week ago. <laughs> we decided to both start companies. Um, and, you know, um, and that sort of, uh, that tends to work out, uh, that works out pretty badly. Um, a good answer is like we've been friends in college for the last three, four years. I'm doing the business side. The other person's doing the tech side. And so there are a lot of ups and downs. And, it's, and you know, what's very different about um, business, um, startups in particular, but business in general from academic, an academic setting is that it's not an individual effort. Like in school, it is you against everybody. You never, you know, you don't, you know, if you have a group project in school, that's like a course where you don't have to do a lot of work or something, you know? Um, and this is like, and it, there's, you don't really learn how to do things in teams. There's a weird athletic context, but outside of that, you don't learn how to work in teams. And so there is sort of this, uh, so I, I do think that's a, that's a dynamic that I'm always very interested in, in looking at and is, is, is quite important. You know, I think the, um, I, th I, think, uh, I think that there were sort of a number of different uh, reasons that enabled so many people from PayPal to do do well afterwards. Uh, you know, it was certainly the, the general timing in the early 2000s was, in retrospect, a good time to start these companies. Uh, there were some very strong friendships that had been formed. So some, some good teams came out of that. Uh, but I think it, I think, um, I think sort of one lesson from PayPal that was, and it, PayPal wasn't, you know, the most, it was a successful but not a, you know, there were definitely companies that have been much more successful than PayPal and had a lot of different challenges. It had challenges with eBay and with the credit card companies and banking regulators and were, you know, fraud issues. There were a lot of different challenges it faced. But the, the, the high-level lesson that one learned inside PayPal was that it was hard but possible to build a great company. And I think that's, that's actually quite a valuable sort of lesson to learn. Um, I think in most uh, companies, the, um, people actually learn either the company fails, and the lesson they learn is it's impossible to build a great company, so we're going to aim for something less ambitious the second time around. And you may succeed at the less ambitious thing, but you'll certainly not build a great company. Or if you are in a company where everything works with no challenges at all, which I think would have been true of, say, Microsoft or, or, or Google, um, the lesson you learn is that it's easy. Um, and, then, uh, and then the next time around, there, there are a lot of mistakes that you end up making. And so... So I think if you look at the talent level, you know, PayPal had about 220 people working in engineering and product and the whole business side at the time of the uh, eBay acquisition. Um, from that group, seven, um, 
seven billion dollar plus companies have been started in the uh, in the 13 years uh, since. Um, Google probably has 30,000 people. They would, uh, you know, if you did a algorithm test or if you did a, you know, you looked at their college grades or whatever, they probably would would be roughly the same level as the 220 people we had at PayPal. And by my count, it may be th there have been maybe three or four billion dollar plus companies started out of Google. So the ratio is something like 200 to one. And so I, I do think that, uh, I do think um, it is in my mind a bit of a strike against people if they come from a place like uh, Google or Microsoft because you probably learned a lot of very, very wrong lessons. Right, we've got a whole handful of questions. So Cindy, then my colleague Tom has someone there, and then Christian, and uh, then we'll go to live stream as well. Uh, Peter, hi. I'm Cindy Gallup. I'm the founder and CEO of Make Love Not Porn. Um, I read your book and I loved it. The three most controversial disruption opportunities in the tech world today are sex, cannabis, and Bitcoin. And entrepreneurs and investors are flocking more to the last two than they are to the first. When you talk about the fact that courage is in much shorter supply than genius, it's in particularly short supply when it comes to sex tech. I'm curious, given everything you've written and talked about, and you've obviously recently led a big bet in the cannabis world, what's your personal view of sex tech? Do you find it as untouchable as the rest of the tech world does? <laughs> wow, you're putting me on the spot here. <coughs> um, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm tempted to say uh, I'm, I'm tempted to say something like there's probably uh, there's probably um, more that I should be thinking about your question than I am, since um, I, my initial reaction is to be somewhat uncomfortable answering your question, and so it's, <laughs> it's probably pretty good. Um, you know, uh, it's pretty good as, an, as a as, as a general answer. Um, I, I would say. Um, let me, let me say uh, one thing. You know, there, there are sort of all these uh, vice-related industries, and, um, and they are, you know, there's sometimes, you have to sort of always ask, you know, why, what, you know are, are they unusually lucrative? If they are unusually lucrative, why are they, why are they unusually lucrative? And, um, and I think, you know, I think, um, I think sort of one of the things that often makes them unusually lucrative is that there's some gray legal zones where people push the envelope on on legal things in, in one way or another. You know, when we we didn't when we when I was running PayPal, we were looking at uh, <coughs> all these sort of payments uh, solutions for adults and there were payments for, uh, for for gaming. And you know, there's sort of a, and it was it was a very big, for example, on the the adult payments space. You had all these really challenging problems where you'd have people put their credit cards down. And then they would do, um, and then they would do these uh, chargebacks. And then uh, the credit card rules are: if you have over one percent chargebacks on a unit basis, you're in the you know warning zone. Over five percent, you automatically get shut down. And so people, you know, you have to show up on their credit card bill, and then um, their spouse would say, "What's this? Oh, it wasn't me. Do a chargeback." So that was sort of the that's sort of the fact pattern. Um, and so, and then there, so so one of the challenge, and so you could. Now you know the the uh, the adult sites would would be happy to pay you know a payments company twelve to fifteen percent on a dollar basis, um, but you had to sort of come up with a hack to do this, and so there was one company we were looking at and we had thought of working doing something with them, um, and they they the hack they came up with was they just uh, they just did about ten times the the volume of fake payments to themselves, where they just uh, made uh, made uh, ten cents charges to themselves, so they got the unit number of payments way up, um, and so they hacked the credit card company, um, and then they, they, ended up, uh, you know, they ended up selling the company for quite a bit of money, uh, and then uh, the acquirer got shut down by the, the card agencies because it took them a few years to figure this out, and uh, you, you got into some trouble. So, that's, so there's always, <coughs> there, is, there is something around a lot of these industries where it's lucrative, but it often, um, you know the, what makes them lucrative is often precisely the the sort of this this, this gray zone that they're in, and that's uh, and that is that is sort of the that is that is a challenge you have to think think about. Um, so we you know we're some we're comfortable investing in things where the regulations are unclear or where there's a regulatory gray zone if we believe that they're on a trend to becoming you know deregulated. So I think. Um, you know, I think the our we have our investment in marijuana was not that big, but it's but I think this is one where it looks like it's a gray zone, but it's it's very rapidly moving away from that. And so there's sort of a one-time opening to to do things. 
And after that, I'm not sure it will be intrinsically a better business than in many other, many other kinds of businesses. Uh, and so that's, but anyway, that's the general question with all the vice-related industries. So I sort, of, I sort of avoided your question, but. Uh. Hi, Peter. Uh, less risque question, but certainly a challenging question. You mentioned Google, Facebook, Microsoft, eBay, PayPal. You haven't mentioned any recent startups or companies you've invested in recently. Who are you excited about that we should check out? Well, um, I, 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 I dislike always sort of just uh, pumping, the, I feel it's always this mistake people make of sort of pumping up the companies uh, they're invested in, but um, I don't know, there's sort of an, any number of, of ones, you know, we like a lot of the ones we're invested with. The, uh, certainly on the, you know, on the, you know, on the, uh, the, the somewhat larger ones that we've been working with for a while are, uh, there's Palantir Technologies, there's Airbnb, there's um, uh, SpaceX, um, um, uh, which I think are all, you know, have sort of a very long runway ahead of them. There's, um, and I think it's always companies where there is sort of some sort of, you know, very unique, um, unique uh, framework. I'll give one, let me try to give one category of a company that, uh, that I think gets underestimated. So we're always, you know, the, the question we always focus on is, you know, can this be a monopoly? Can this become a monopoly? And, um, and so, you know, what makes a company a monopoly? So it could be that you have super fast distribution on a very thin product. This would be like Twitter. Or, you know, or a lot of the sort of super fast viral Pinterest Twitter sort of fits that. You can have something where there's sort of a technological advantage that you have and then you sort of gradually build on. This is the way we often think of innovation. You come up with something new and then you iterate and, and steadily improve. And this is like a lot of enterprise soft, a lot of SaaS software. You come with a new product, you keep improving it, you, you get it out. Um, occasionally you have things where there's a really brilliant breakthrough. So this is like Bitcoin or, you know, it's, uh, we don't have, that's actually a much less common modality. So most of it's always iterative improvement. Occasionally it's brilliant breakthroughs. But, there, but, a, but a third, a different kind of modality for innovation that um, I think we do very little and we don't even recognize as an important category is what I would describe as a complex coordination, where you take a lot of different pieces and the challenge is to get coordinate them into into something new, uh, uh, the and sort of it, this is this is the thing that's maybe you know 180 degrees antithetical to the lean startup ethos. So it's it's complicated. It's this re, you have to get all the pieces together in just the right way, and I think this was on some level um, this was on some level what really drove Apple as a as an innovation in in the last uh, in the last. Uh, 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 as an innovative company in the last decade. You know, when you have the biographies written on Jobs, it's always like, he was like a real mean person. And, and it, it sort of it yelled at people a lot. And this is, this is sort of roughly the level on which we understand what happened. But it was, but it was you, have to, you have to at least beg the question, why was it inspiring? And it was inspiring because there was this coordination where you build it. And so if you ask, what was new about the iPhone? There was no single component that was new. It was just you pulled all these things together in just the right way including the whole super complicated manufacturing supply line. And once you'd built it, um, this was actually super hard for people to replicate. It took, you had, a, you had an advantage for many years, and then you could get network lock in, in terms of you know, the, um, the app developer community or the brand or, or things, things like that. I think um, if you look at a company like uh, Tesla or SpaceX, uh, we're big in uh, SpaceX, but let me use Tesla as an example, um, you know, the key Again, there's no component to the Tesla that's actually that new. It's just you pulled all the pieces together, you then you re-engineered the whole distributor network, you got that in, uh, and it was this complex coordination that, uh, that made it work. And, uh, and so it's, it's, it's like what Elon succeed, there's like this lost art of accounting, where you figure out how much things cost, and you, uh, you, you add all the different things together, and Elon has rediscovered this lost art of accounting, which other people can no longer practice, and why it's, very hard at this point to create a competitor to, uh, to, to Tesla. One of the companies that we're invested here in New York City that, uh, that we're very bullish on, <clears throat> that, that, again, that again I would describe in terms of complex coordination is a company called Oscar, which is a uh, healthcare insurance uh, business. And, the, and, and sort of the, the, the idea was that um, you know, in healthcare there's sort of all these point IT solutions you can have where uh, we can figure out things to do with data that make it better in one way or another. Tons of people doing all these sort of thin healthcare IT apps. And if you think about it as a sales process, 
in, uh, in the health space, um, there's always a question, who are you selling to? Are you selling to uh, the, con uh, the consumers, the patients, the doctors, the hospitals, the insurers, the government? And most of the time, people go to the you know, patients, doctors, which are the easy people to sell to. But that's actually not where the real value add is. The transformation happens if you can change the best practices on the level of hospitals or insurers or governments. Um, super hard sales process. These are super ossified industries. And what Oscar concluded was this was a complex coordination problem you could only solve if you actually set up a whole insurance company. And so you had to start with the insurance company and then build the IT around it. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, I would say it's, it's underrated because people don't think of complex coordination as a type of problem to solve, and so they don't see it as this incredible barrier to entry that exists. We're in Oscar through Thrive, and we're in Airbnb through Sherpa, so. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Um, so Peter, we have a question from our um, multi-thousand strong live stream audience, um, and it's, um, where in the rest of the world, um, maybe outside the U.S. globally, where do you see um, some innovative um, ideas coming from startups being born, and um, and what might those be? Well, I think I think there is um, there's um, you know, I think I think they they, they they can certainly happen all over the world. So there's no um, I don't think there's a deep geographic limitation or or anything like that. Uh, there's certainly Silicon Valley. Um, you know, I think has had a pretty big advantage over the last 10 to 15 years because you have these network effects. Uh, and there, there is something very uh, efficient in Silicon Valley because if you're in a place where a lot of innovation is happening, you can look around and if someone else is doing something better than you, you know you're not likely to succeed. Um, and then on the other hand, if you're doing the best in Silicon Valley, there's a good chance you're the best in the world. Um, whereas if you're in, you know, um, pick on some some stereot if you're in Peoria, Illinois, um, Indiana, Peoria, Ill uh, uh, Illinois, whatever, uh, uh, Peoria, Illinois, um, you will um, you may be the best uh, company in a certain category in that city, but uh, you have much less of a context how you stack up globally. So I think that's always the challenge when you're outside uh, these networks. But there are there also are disadvantages to Silicon Valley. There are, you know, you have um, the, the network effects can go in reverse where you get a lot of sort of uh, group think, crowd think, lemming like, ape like, sheep like behavior. Uh, and there's a point where it's gotten very, very costly at this point as well, which, you know, I, th I think at some point has to be a limitation. So I think, I think things can happen, you know, in many different areas. There is, um, I'm, I'm personally always um, somewhat more bullish on the uh, developed world for. Uh, for innovation, and so the places we would tend to look would be U.S., different parts of the U.S. We'd look at Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Western Europe, Israel. Um, you know, we haven't looked at Japan or uh, South Korea, but those would be other places we'd be <coughs> very open to exploring. Um, and we're sort of much more skeptical of the EM uh, convergence version, even though I think that, that there are a lot of copycat cloning companies that can work in India or China, Brazil, places like that. Um, but there's much, le you know, I think the, the developing countries just have to catch up to the developed world. They're still really poor. Uh, whereas in the developed world, you need to actually innovate and do new things. So I think to the extent you're talking about innovation, uh, breakthrough technology, inventing new things, the, the, the need, pressure, et cetera, is greatest in the developed world. And that's where, where we're biased to look. Thank you. Um, question for Christian. Hi, Peter. I'm Christian with Verizon Ventures. My question is about the other incumbents that aren't necessarily Google that can argue for a bigger piece of the marketing pie. What about American Express or Verizon or Aetna? How do they interact with these new startups that are shaping the future? Do they enable them by investing or collaborating with them? Do they consume their software? Or do they just sit back and become the next Radio Shack? Um. Let's see. Well, there, there certainly are lots of different things that can happen. Um, I would say, um, I, let me just let me just um, try to address this from the point of view of of the startup where you're you're starting one of these companies. I don't think I don't think that your goal in starting a company should be to disrupt or destroy a big company. 
Okay, your goal is to create a successful company, and this is why I'm I'm, I'm very skeptical. I really dislike disruption as a buzzword. I think it's this one of these horrible overused buzzwords. Um, you know, a disruptive person is someone who looks for trouble and finds it. The disruptive person in elementary school gets sent to the principal's office. You know, Napster was a very disruptive company. It set out to destroy the music industry. I think that you can argue they sort of succeeded at doing that. The people got on the front page of Time magazine. You know, a year later, it got shut down by the government. So, you know, you nap some music, you nap a kid. That's disruptive, but it's, um, it's not constructive. And so I think, I think one shouldn't really take one's bearings from, um, you know, destroying existing companies. And certainly, there are ways things can change. But PayPal, <coughs> you know, PayPal did create a new payment solution. On some level, it constrained what the card companies like Visa, MasterCard, Amex could do. On some level, it extended what they could do. So, you know, they didn't like us that much, but it wasn't that hostile. It was not a zero-sum disruption uh, dynamic. And so I do think that in a lot of these areas, uh, there's room for growth. And you know, your success doesn't require large existing companies to fail. Someone on your end? Hi. Um, so with all the talk about monopolies, I wonder uh, how you reconcile the merits of monopolies with the dangers of letting them run free, because entrusting companies with monopolies means that you have to entrust them to self-restraint and, and not you know, take over, not be evil. Well, there's a, there's a public policy question, at what point are monopolies good or, good or bad? I think, <coughs> I think they become bad in a static world, where a monopoly is just a toll uh, collector at a bridge, the tax collector, toll collector, or it's like the Parker Brothers board game where you just reshuffle the existing properties and nothing changes. I think in a dynamic world, um, you know, uh, you know, you're not creating artificial scarcity. So when Apple invents um, a smartphone that works, that's not restricting supply. It's it's creating um, creating a supply where none existed, and this is reflect. You know, we have antitrust laws to stop bad monopolies, and we have copyright intellectual property laws and things like that to encourage good monopolies. And I think the good monopolies, even if it's not in a software context dominated by IP, it's that the, the idea behind IP is what what uh, what makes uh, what makes uh, a lot of these software monopolies more good than bad. If you told me you had one that was going to you know, stop all innovation and sort of uh, sit down on everybody and squash everybody for the next hundred years. That's probably a pretty, pretty unhealthy dynamic. I think in practice that's not been the case. So you know, you know, people were worried about that with IBM in the 70s, Microsoft in the in the in the 90s. With the benefit of hindsight, these were probably the points at which the monopolies were eroding as a result of changing markets in any event. So IBM, it was the shift from hardware to software, Microsoft from desktop to internet. Um, and, um, and so I would, I would be disturbed if you have a permanent monopoly. I think you know, most of the time they're like a decade, two decades, they're not permanent. And I, and I do think the existence of these monopolies is what, uh, in, you know, it does uh, encourage so much innovation. You know, why is so much capital being put into the software industry? Um, and I mean, I think it is a policy problem that we don't have enough capital going into other industries. You know, it's, there are, like, I think, clean, uh, let's come, come back to clean energy. I think it would be good if we had more innovation in, uh, in clean tech. It's just the business models don't work. And as a result, we're going to have very slow innovation in that area, even though it would be very good for our society. Um, we, and we're going to have enormous amounts of innovation in software, which I think is, you know, not as important as clean tech, but it's still pretty good for our society. But it's because the business models actually work, um, and so I think I think um, I think the fact that these monopolies can be created and are so valuable that's what attracts capital, talent, and that's what uh, that's a part of the dynamic that drives the whole system forward. Thank you. We have a question here in the back. Hi, Peter. Uh, this relates a little bit to the question you just answered and your comments on um, developed economies, but in the business view that you've laid out just in this world of businesses that compete and monopolies, there's a lot open to policy risk, of course. So what role do you see policy playing? And is that, is that risk something that you really consider to be a strong component of that? And along with that, do you believe that that dichotomy is an absolute? Or is it true in the world we live in right now 
um, but it could be something that washes away in, say, 20 years if things were to go a certain way. Let's see. There's so many different uh, elements of that question. I'm hard to know where to, where to start. So obviously, um, with respect to the monopoly question, there's sort of a, <coughs> there is sort of always, if you, if you had a government that tried to destroy all monopolies, good or bad or indifferent, uh, that would be that would be problematic. You know, the the I, I don't think you know I don't I think the fr from my perspective I think the antitrust laws are being enforced to about the right level in this country. You know, it takes a pretty high bar to get to a bad monopoly where you you get a really big government action, and I think they don't really discourage people from from starting. The, the sort of creative monopolies I described. The policy issue I, I'm, I'm much more concerned about tends to be regulatory, where I think there are, you know, I think there are a lot of industries that are heavily regulated, um, you know, um, and I think that's, you know, it's, it's and so I think it's both the microeconomics and the regulations that often um, make things very difficult. And so, so uh, biotech is an area where you should be able to generate monopolies and, and very successful companies. But when it costs you $100,000 to start a software company and a billion dollars to get a drug through the FDA, um, you're going to get uh, less investment and, uh, and a lot less progress there than you otherwise would. And so I think we have this, uh, we have sort of a fairly light regulatory regime in this country with respect to the world of bits. We tend to have very heavy regulation with respect to the world of atoms. You can have a policy debate, you can say, well, atoms should be regulated, bits don't threaten anyone, they shouldn't be. But we do have a very different double standard. You know, if the FDA got to regulate uh, computer video games, and you had to do a double-blind study on a computer video game to figure out, was it addictive? Was it damaging to your brain? What did it do to your mental abilities, et cetera, et cetera? Um, you'd have much less innovation in, uh, in, in, in the video game industry. So I do think, I do think the regulatory questions are, make, make a big difference. All right, we have one more question from our live stream audience, um, and then one from uh, here in the back. Um, you said Uber is one of Silicon Valley's most challenged companies, um, most ethi ethically challenged companies. Um, it's also one of the most valuable. Um, can you say more about your comments and thoughts on Uber? Well, I always, I always think I have to start with, uh, with a full disclosure that uh, you know, we're investors in Lyft, and so we're, I'm, a I'm a little bit biased here. <coughs> I always think it's OK to be biased as long as you disclose your biases. Um, but you know, it's it's obviously look. There's obviously there's always this question how um, how aggressively uh, people can push the envelope in uh, in uh, what they what they uh, what what they're doing in, in different ways. And I think um, I think that uh, that um, that Uber has certainly pushed the envelope fairly uh, fairly aggressively on on many counts. And uh, I think it's sort of I think the jury is still out whether it's in the zone where. Um, it will get stopped like Napster was, or you know, it will get away with it. But it's, it certainly has pushed the envelope uh, really hard. Thank you. Um, all right, one here in the back. My name is Bill Hessert with Derby Jackpot. And um, I'm curious, uh, my, my two brothers and I, we have a small company. And as we seek our next round of financing, I'm curious how we do so in a way that's not like starting a restaurant, but we're how we reach excellent investors uh, at your tier in an um, unusual way, a, a way that basically doesn't get cut off with everybody else. Um, let's see. I, <clears throat> I'm always hesitant to give advice on how to pitch us or something, but I think um, <laughs> I, th I think it's it's um, you know in 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 practice. Uh, it's it often you know often ends up being uh, trusted people we know that make references and that's how you know that's how we get people in the door and how we, we set up meetings. So it's always it's always like a network effect part of it that that drives a lot of it. Uh, we we always do like you know we do like these very these very clean clean um, stories for you know you know why this makes sense why does the business uh, really work. I would say one. Um, I'll give one perspective as a as an investor that that I have, which I think is is, is I don't I don't think it's the way. It's, it's, I, people think about this to some extent, but it's not the way uh, people often talk about it. So the you know one of the you know the standard negotiation when you're raising a financing round is always what's the valuation of your company, and um, 
and what is, what is your company going to be worth? And this is sort of like, well, the investors want to have a low valuation, the founders you want to have a high valuation. And it's typically framed as some sort of premium on the last round. So you, we did, the last round was here, we've made all this progress, now we deserve something that's two, twice that much, four times that much, or, or whatever. So that's sort of the way the debate gets typically framed. Um, now I think that's conceptually completely wrong. I think it's, it's always, the value is never a premium on the past, it's always a discount to the future. And, um, and so, so, the, uh, <coughs> so I think the, the, way, um, the way I always think one should try to pitch a company or the, uh, the value of a company is by explaining why it will be worth a lot more in the future. And so the investors are getting to invest at a point that's, um, that's a lot cheaper than it will be for uh, the share price a year, two, three years from now. Um, you know, when we, when we, uh, when we started uh, PayPal, we had sort of a whole series of different financing rounds in early 99, mid 99, late 99. And, um, and we did sort of one, we had sort of, we launched it, the product was starting to take off. We had sort of one crazy up round in March 2000 vis-a-vis -vis December 99. So the December 99 round was, uh, it was at about, it was at about 45 million post. We then had a 50-50 combination with Elon's company. And then we did the, uh, the March 2000 round, three months later we did it at 500 pre. So it was a sort of a roughly 5x step up on a per share basis. Um, 500 pre, 600 post. And so there's always a question, how do you get a 5x step up in three months? Even if a product's growing pretty quickly, it's kind of a hard thing to, how do you, how do you convince people to do that? And, um, and, and you know, the way we presented the round was, this is gonna be the last round before the IPO. And so you got people thinking, okay, the next thing is the IPO, so you're getting in at a discount to the IPO. It doesn't matter what happened three months ago, you're getting in at a discount to the IPO. And so always think of it as a premium, as a discount to the future, never a premium on the past. Awesome, all right, we have time for one last question, um, and then we'll get to uh, Peter signing a few books. Um, so the gentleman here in the back. Two-part question. Uh, it'll be two parts because I'm not sure if you're going to answer the first part. Uh, so the first part is about a specific investment, uh, zero. Uh, we use the software, really like it a lot, but I was somewhat surprised to see you guys invest in it because it's a really cool product, really slick user interface, but it seems like somebody's going to come in and, and copy it very quickly. So it doesn't lend itself to a monopoly type business. Um, and then the second question is about monopolies. Um, to your point, in tech industries, monopolies tend to last a decade, two decades. Um, why not, for you personally or for your investment vehicles, go after monopolies that can last five decades, right? Almost Buffett-esque looking at railroads. Um, like how come you're choosing technology specifically? Um, let's see, well, a uh, couple of, couple of uh, perspectives on this. So let me, I, I'm, I, I do think there's always some dynamism and in innovation in tech. So, you, so if, if, if you said that you had something that was gonna be a monopoly that was gonna last five decades, you would say there's going to be absolutely nothing that changes. I mean, I'm not even sure that's true, like with railroads. You know, people thought that was true of railroads in the early 20th century, and then it shifted to highways and airplanes and things. You know, things changed a lot. Maybe they're going back to railways. Maybe, but maybe it'll be more bicycles. Maybe it'll be people live in more urban settings. Um, and so it's it's I think quite hard to think ahead over over five decades. Um, and and I, I do think that. Um, in tech, I, I think there is a way in which, um, I would say sort of the old economy, there's sort of a class of companies where people understand the monopoly nature quite well. I think in the technology space, this is always understood much less well. What kinds of tech companies are monopolies, what kinds are not? And so it, it's one where this is a very useful question, whereas you know it's like a utility company, it's like a regulated monopoly, you know, or, you know, you know, Coca-Cola is sort of a brand monopoly, and you know, it's, it is what it is, you sort of understand it, and then it's all sort of priced in to varying degrees. I think in tech, it's, it somehow is much more inefficient, much less well understood, which is why I'm attracted to it. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, that's fantastic, thank you, Peter. <laughs>